Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Henrik Schwarzbach. I'm a process technologist at Gianairo who makes spray dryers. Uh, today I will talk a little bit about spray drying um, with sort of an angle to heat sensitive materials, but mostly I will be talking about spray drying. Um, so, first of all, a little bit background behind spray drying in the pharmaceutical industry. We have been doing so in for many years and spray drying has been used for a lot of uh, different applications. Um, in recent years there's been a lot of focus on uh, modified release and, and um, increased bioavailability. Um, but um, recently well, there's been increasing focus in uh, spray drying of, of heat sensitive materials, uh, proteins and such like, and vaccines. Uh, among us, because um, free, uh, spray drying can be an alternative to freeze drying, also in um, terms of uh, drying aseptic materials. Um, but um, even even though that the uh, spray drying of heat sensitive materials is, is uh, some of the interest has been in the vaccine and all other parental business, is a wrong range of uh, traditional product that means spray dried that has been heat sensitive. Uh, in the food industry, for instance, uh, spray drying is, is one of the preferred methods of, of spray drying heat sensitive materials uh, because of its cost effectiveness uh, and also because of the ability to engineer powders into a specific form for, for some reason. Uh, for the food industry, it's typically something with dissolution rate or handling. For the pharmaceutical industry, it's, it's more um, the, the encapsulation um, and bioavailability reasons. To uh, understand the reason why at spray drying is quite well suited for heat sensitive materials, we have to look a little bit, uh, take a step back into what's occurring inside the spray dryer. Um, I'll try to take it a step all the way back to, to what happens to the single droplet. Um, inside the dryer, we uh, atomize the feed, we make droplets, small droplets with a large surface area where we expose them to heat from the surrounding drying gas and solvents evaporating from the surface. And this, this um, of course, um, can be controlled. And in the spray dryer, we control it by controlling the temperatures in the surrounding of the particles, the, the humidity of the surroundings, and the droplet size. Um, this is what we can do in terms of control from a machine or a process perspective. Uh, of course, there's much more going on inside the droplet. The, um, the chemistry or the um, physics of the particle forming is a significant part. That is all in in the that's all determined by the formulation. So, so a large part of any any process drying spray drying process is is the formulation. We can do a lot about the surroundings, but what is recurring is determined by what kind of material you are drying. It's it's somewhat also the Achilles heel of, of spray drying processes, at least in the hands of, of not too experienced developers that they, they, they try to apply a standard method which doesn't work for that particular product. Um, but shifting the process parameters, you can find very good operating uh, parameters just a short way of, from there. But back to the heat sensitive materials. Um, frequently we have other processes occurring, not just the mechanical formation of a droplet, but also um, chemical degradation and so on. And those are typically controlled by three factors, the time, the temperature, and the stabilization. So, for instance, unfolding of proteins due to uh, the removal of water is something that, that is nothing to do with time and temperature, it's but mostly something to do with the removal of water, and therefore stabilization, in terms, for instance, of sugars, is an essential part. But time and temperature. Uh, is of essence, and that's two things that, that uh, at least one thing that spray drying do with very well, time, very, very fast drying. Temperature, that's where the, well, the traditional uh, comment we've, we meet when we talk with the um, clients that are used to freeze drying is that temperature is way too high. Um, I must say that I generally find that uh, this turns out to be a um, exaggeration, sometimes a very big ex exaggeration. A little bit of stabilization. Um, one of the interesting parts of the spray drying process, because of the fast drying, the particles are drying at low temperature. 
they are basically starting at low temperature because of the evaporation from the surface. Just like when you make your uh, finger wet and put it in the air to feel the direction of the wind. Or well, it's colder because of the evaporation of, uh, of solvent water from your finger. Same goes for the particle. So the particles are s gradually heated as they are drying and only when they are fully dried they reach the maximum temperature. I'll t show you later what that is. But that allows the drying to occur at, at low temperatures and therefore we can use glass states to um, stabilize uh, products. Just uh, the amper here is, is sort of an illustration of that, which is not what happening in spray dryer, but we have basically a solidification of the particle temperatures below the glass transition temperature um, into a homogeneous uh, mix of a glass phase with the molecules to be protected in, uh, embedded in that glass phase. Um, this is all in, in the formulation, so it's not something I will cover too much about here. But for the, the history of the particles, I, I need to tell a little bit of the, the techniques we use to illustrate it, or the techniques I will use to illustrate it here. One is computational fluid dynamics. Uh, it's a, basically a, a um, brute force uh, setting up a problem putting up the, mo uh, the mathematical models for it and solving in a very large computer. This, this uh, can only done, be done to a certain extent. We have the macro problem, the spray drying, what's occurring inside it, and we'll take that and split it up to smaller and smaller elements to look at those. Uh, compute, compute the effect of one, one pressure, one temperature in one field, how it affects the next one. If we could, if we had big enough computers, we'd do that on a molecular level, but we don't have these large computers, so uh, nobody has. Um, so we, we do, uh, do it in a microscopic level, and we can build some very good models for what's occurring inside a spray drum. Oh, the same kind of technology is used for making, making windmills, uh, ships, uh, uh, airplanes, and so on, to predict flows. The other other methods we're using what we call a drying kinetic analyzer. It's a um, basically a device that can levitate a single particle in an ultrasonic field. So you have a droplet of less than one millimeter hanging in midair, suspended. I'll show you a video and show why. And while we monitor that droplet and drying of them, we can also monitor the drying speed and the morphology that comes out of that. So we can build a mathematical model of the drying behavior for very wide range of drying conditions and we can combine these computer models of the flow patterns with the drying model of the particles and we can get some very accurate computer models showing what's going on inside the dryer. And that's what I'm going to illustrate to you. These tools are what I'm going to use to illustrate to you what's occurring inside the dryer and how the particles are drying. First of all, the drying of particles. These are two PVP particles in a mixture of ethanol and methylene chloride drying at the same temperature in this ultrasonic field. The only difference between these two uh, experiments is in one experiment you have a humidified uh, atmosphere. So the nice spherical particle is drying in an atmosphere that is pure nitrogen at, at 50 degrees C, sorry, um, at yeah, 50 degrees C, but with a higher relative humidity of water, 70% relative humidity of water, which completely changes the morphology of the particle and how way it dries. So understand these things, you can build these very powerful and very accurate models because we now can predict exactly what's going on with the particle at a different point in the dryer for those few milliseconds it's there. If we take these combined models and put it into a spray drying, we'll get something like this, which is a picture of the flow patterns inside one plane of the spray dryer. The blue blue plane is is the typical plot for a a spray dryer used for heat sensitive materials, which namely is that it has a high velocity input. So we have high velocity of the in, incoming gas, and we have high velocity of the atomization zone where the droplets are made, which is the the red zone in the top. So you have co co-current drying. You have the hot airs entering just basically at the same point as where the atomization is occurring. High velocity, high velocity mixing, very, very short residence time in that zone, and also very, very fast mixing and very, very high heat transfer coefficients, which ensure that the drying occurs very, very fast. 
and as you can see the velocity increases in bottom as where the gas comes out of the drying chamber again. The second one is, is, is uh, in this case the moisture content, for, this is a case where we are drying um, a ba feed based on water. And the last one, which is probably a more interesting one, is that we have the temperature that in the gas. So you can see the high inlet temperature zone, uh, the purple uh, area, but how fast that temperature basically is, is cooled down to the outlet conditions. So the bulk of the drying chamber is at outlet conditions. So the relevant temperature to look at the heat damage of the particles is the outlet temperature. The rest of the time in the hot zone is very, very short because of the high velocities and the particles are at that point wet. So they are evaporatively cooled whereas they, when they start to, to dry and the, dry, um, and the rate of drying uh, is slowed down and the particle starts to heat up, we are far away from the hot inlet zone and we are in the outlet zone area. This is a, a dynamic model of, cells, uh, of, of the same, just showing how the, the flow patterns are uh, fluctuating a little bit, but basically being uh, stable and, and not changing in time. This is about three months worth of calculation on, on 128 of par parallel processors on a supercomputer. So, so it's, um, it doesn't look at much, but it's, it's um, quite a lot of calculations. When, when this, this uh, spray dryer has been developed before the computer tools, and this knowledge of high velocity mixing and so on has been known for many years and been used uh, extensively in the food industry. Um, and it can be, of course, been applied to um, to small uh, to both big and small dryers. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry has, with typical, developed uh, their products on smaller dryers. Uh, it just showed a, an array of, of the dryers that that we supply in that market for various sizes. The SD Micro in the corner, being the smallest one, which is comparable to a lot of the other lab dryers in the market. The Buki B290 springs to mind. Basically, very small dryers. Um, cable while running small samples, but also quite limited. I'll come back to that in a second. And a, very, a host of other dryers of one size up, uh, what we would call mobile miners or, or PSD ones, in different executions depending on on um, degree of uh, containment and com uh, cleanability. And well, from one of the pictures, it's an aseptic dryer uh, producing sterile drug product. All of these small dryers do what I've described before, fast mixing, small droplets, extremely fast drying, and they can be operating at quite low temperatures. Um, not only um, giving a consistent short residence time, but all, and a fast drying. But how do these scale? What happens when we scale up? Um, one of the things that is, is um, different about spray drying is that the small dryers are actually the most limited ones. And the main reason for this is, is the drying time we need. When a particle leaves the nozzle where it's atomized, it has high velocity, typically 100 meters per second or more. So it has a trajectory that uh, stretches out to the chamber. The larger it is, the large more it acts as like a cannonball, the further it will fly before the gas flow inside the dryer will deflect its flow pattern and guide it towards the the, the outlet and, and away from the walls. But large particles will tend to hit the wall and be sticky. So the, the core problem of, of any spray dryer is to make sure that the particles are dried before they hit the wall. A lot of small scale test work developing a spray drying process fail, not because the product cannot be spray dried, but because some of these products hits the wall, sits there for half an hour in a wet state, falls off, come out, and is ruined. Not because of the spray drying process, but because some deposits were not managed well. So to illustrate this a little bit better, this is a similar test as you saw before with a suspended particle. This time it's just on a, a glass um, a fiber, and you hear the the product has been dried for 98 seconds in this, with this particle size which is around one millimeter and sticks to a plate or touches the plate where it immediately sticks. As, as the particle size is, is increased, 
oh sorry, the drying time is increased, the stickiness uh, gradually disappear, which as, as one would expect. With this method, for this product, this can be illustrated, if I could change. These measurements of stickiness point and drying time for that particular product that I showed before, which is a, a maltodextrin, quite uh, quite uh, mundane, but but a good model uh, substance. Um, you have the in the blue curve here is, is the drying of a water droplet, or a, 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 but the the red line is the maltodextrin drying. As you can see, the the uh, particles. Uh, size is uh, shifting down towards the minimum where basically particle doesn't shrink anymore but you also see that the curve is flattened which cause the drying velocity is dropping so the rate of drying drops so initially high drying rate and then slower drying rate it results in a, in a pattern where the temperature is is not increasing uh, in the beginning no, not so much there's a big temperature difference because of a lot of evaporate cooling and then it approach, slowly approaches the outlet temperature these curves are a little bit strange in the sense that, that normalized diameter is used. So you have a particle size on the bottom here, which is, is um, our drying time, which is second, uh, normalized with the particle size. If I put in uh, a, a, a x-axis here, which has the uh, real part, uh, a particle size in there, for instance 100 microns, then you would see the full drying time, which was more than 100 seconds for the one millimeter particle size, has been reduced quite dramatically in the case of 100 micron particle size. So now, with a 100, 100 micron particle size, well, somewhat less than five seconds it will take to dry it. If we make it a 20 micron particle, this time is further reduced dramatically. Basically, because the surface area to volume ratio changes dramatically. If we plot the uh, drying times that were shown on, on the previous slide in there, so first error would be sticky product, second error would be slightly sticky error, and third error basically non-sticky error. So we would need, for a 100 micron particle, we would need something like two and a half, three seconds before the particle hits the wall. In a, f a flow field inside a spray dryer where it's 20 meters per second, it's quite far. So this is the basic reason why we cannot make large particles in small dryers. And if you try, you're not doing spray drying, you're doing, doing vertical uh, tray drying, and you may knock it off and you get something that is not spray dried and is not having the characteristics of the spray dry product. 20 microns, it gets better. But when you look at the residence time, for instance, in something like the SD Micro I showed you earlier, or B Buki B290 or something, the residence time in those for the gas is less than one second. And the particles, large particles, will have much less than that before they hit the wall. So that's the reason why even making 20 micron particles in these dryers easily becomes a challenge. So, just to illustrate this a little bit more, this is an example of the previous trial where you saw the, the flow fields inside the spray dry, the same simulation. This time we're just only focusing on track particles. So they, as they move away in time from, from the nozzle, they will, of course, dry. In this particular case, we were si trying to simulate the, 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 fo the um, formation of deposits. So we pushed the drying conditions to the limit and we found a, a problematic area down at the cone. These particles are maybe 70, 80 microns, but this is a drying chamber that's four meter tall. So um, for this particular product, um, that was the limit with those conditions we could do. But what is more interesting, when you look at these real dryers in reality, um, they, they may look large and they for a lot of other processes like mixing and, and some uh, batch fluid beds and so on, it's going larger, it means a loss of control. Difficulty in maintaining constant conditions. Maintain, difficulty of doing the same as you do in small scale. With the spray dryers, we get less secondary effects. For instance, we imagine a small spray dryer. We have the walls very close, so we have, have to be very, very careful we're not hitting in the wall. In a large dryer, that becomes less of a problem. In a small dryer, you have 
relatively to the drying gas, relatively to the heat you put into the dryer, you have a much larger surface area. So you have a much larger part of your drying process that goes as a heat loss. So in the large dryer, that is reversed. So you get a, a, a drying system that is less, you have less boundary effects, less uh, losses of, uh, or less percentage-wise heat loss, less um, uh, product that risks hitting the wall, and you get a, a process that, because it's continuous, and you have a continuous mixing of a gas stream and a liquid stream, you have basically maintaining the same conditions for each and each individual particle inside the process, which makes the the efficiency go up, uh, makes the maintaining all the power engineering tools and maintaining the possibility of making exact same product as you did in a small dryer, but also giving you more options of doing different things, which is strongly exploited in the food and the industry, for instance, to make advanced products that you can't, can't hope to do in a small dryer. But, but there they, they are the difference between making something horrible and something that can be sold. Some of that can also be used in the pharmaceutical industry. Just as importantly, um, all, all the aspects of, of, of the machinery, the con ability to maintain containment, the ability to operate with nasty solvents, the ability to operate as uh, aseptic conditions and so on, are still maintained at the large level. Um, I guess that was all I had to say to you today, so thank you and if you have any questions you are most welcome.